Good morning to you all. Um, my colleague Keith Bodger would have been here in my place, but he's decided to take his holidays and disappear off to sunnier climes. But in our team, he's the gastroenterologist and obviously closest to the alcohol problem. Um, we uh, have a number of projects on in a number of disease areas, and we're interested in trying to use the data that exists in the health service to identify where the problems are, and if possible, find some levers to get started on the problem, and then to know if you're making a difference. Alcohol is a particularly difficult one because it is so diverse. We have a range of interests here. We have hospitals who provide a disease-focused uh, approach. We have primary care, if the patient's registered with primary care, that is. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they do a certain amount uh, with alcohol, but it varies across the patch as to how interested they are, or indeed how interested the patients are in going to the GP. <coughs> Social services and uh, councils have a big role, and there are many fiefdoms within a council. Housing, social services, district nursing aren't always working in immediate collaboration. And we mustn't forget there's also the inter interaction with the crime, with crime and the law. And the courts are full of problem pe people, problems caused by alcohol, as Ian illustrated. And this works two ways. The institutions have a relationship to the patients, and an individual patient may have relationships with all four of those and more, and no one knows that the other one is involved. And one of the thoughts we had was, could we start to spot the patients? When we start looking at it, we have all the various organizations who might be interested in the data, and so we had to start to say, well, what approach could we take clinically to identifying people who were in trouble? We know that lots of people might be interested, so we had to think about also um, what, they meant, what it meant clinically in terms of a contact for, uh, in identifying a patient with alcohol, uh, alcohol problems. We didn't want to spot the patient who had the, a single binge and nothing more, and nothing more was heard about them. We didn't want to pick up those who coded in hospitals as drinking alcohol because we're encouraged to record it just as anyone might have a social drink. So that particular code doesn't help us to identify problems. Um, so we've, we've talked to a number of people in these areas and clinicians and come up with a series of algorithms which apply to hospital data. The hospital data for every admission codes up to 20 diagnosis codes. And these vary from symptoms through to very specific diseases. So it might be a symptom fainted. It might be a severe illness, cirrhosis. And these are quite difficult to amalgamate together. And I'm not going to do the detail, but to say that much of the data we're presenting is, a, I would say, a more sophisticated analysis than in many of the top-level stats which Ian was presenting before, which are based on just looking at the first code in the list. We've t we took the Aintree Hospital data because we had rights to have access to it and looked at the catchment of Aintree. And Aintree covers a little bit of Sefton at the top here, above the black line. It has a North Liverpool and it has Kirby. Um, all of them have problems, but we were able to select those areas um, which specifically refer to Aintree Hospital. So we've got more than 80% of the admissions from these areas will present at Aintree, and more than 90% of alcohol-related problems. So we've got a, an, a catchment for a hospital, and we can look at these little areas in between. Each one of those little zones is called a lower social output area. Now, this is a, a, a term used by the um, uh, mappers, and it defines an area with about um, 1,200 people, ab ab about 500 homes. Um, so these are small areas that we can legitimately look at in data terms. If we simply map it by deprivation, the area red marks Sefton, and we can quite clearly see that in Sefton there are two big areas of deprivation, Netherton and the Seaforth area. North Liverpool has got a big problem around Croxteth. 
Uh, uh, Kirby, uh, not surprisingly, has quite a big patch of deprivation too. Um, we can uh, look at the total numbers are coming in. The total numbers presenting to Aintree with an alcohol-related problem is high as a percentage of the take, and I'll come back to the types in a moment. Um, if we look at those who've got any coding, uh, who, sorry, those who've presented with an alcohol problem but have liver disease as well, it's quite high. It's a quarter of them. We are able to do something more sophisticated that if on condition visit A, you're, not, you're just coded as, shall we say, um, uh, an alcohol-related fracture, um, you, it, it, sorry, the, the, uh, you may have had a fracture, but they didn't label the alcohol. But on a previous visit to hospital, you had cirrhosis. Now, you don't get rid of cirrhosis, so we are able to link admissions going forward and back to get a picture of all those who really do have an alcohol-related problem, and whether it's a liver problem or whether it's alcohol pre-liver. In many ways, it's the pre-liver ones we're most interested in because, to a large extent, they are potentially curable. Once cirrhosis has happened, you can help the problem, but you can't get rid of it. These patients can present to all parts of a hospital. Um, obviously, to accident emergency, the big numbers go to gastroenterology. A lot go to respiratory medicine, overlap with smoking. A lot go to surgery, facio-maxillary surgery, bashed-in faces and things. So we've, we're hunting for these patients around the hospital. And that's relevant that if you want to find the patients who've got alcohol problems, it's not just looking in one place. But hospital coding systems can help you find them. Um, I've explained that already, that we're particularly interested in separating out the, uh, the frequent flyers with acute alcohol problems pre-liver, because they're the ones we're going to be able to do the most for. They're also the most elusive people. Um, uh, and many of these have lots of admissions. 4% of the alcohol admissions were on their 10th or subsequent admission within seven years. So these are your frequent flyers um, who are going to continue coming back because we tend to treat them, sort them out, and kick them out. And there is no good link in most areas to what's happening with them in the community. <coughs> Many good efforts, and the, the, uh, the alcohol outreach teams do their best, but they are not intimately fused with housing with fire service, with all the other agencies who need to be involved and who are often involved unknown to each other. So let's just start looking at some of these areas. If you look at all admissions to Aintree, um, you can see there are two red hotspots which coincided with our areas of deprivation um, uh, who have the most general medical uh, all-cause emergency admissions. Um, Th those areas are about twice as many admissions as a control area. In our control area, we've taken the area to the uh, northeast of that map, which is Magull Lydiate, three bedroom semi territory, very average for England. And compared to that, these areas have twice as many admissions. When we start looking at each of the areas, so this is each lower social output area, and the numbers of admissions per um, uh, thousand population, we see there is a huge difference between the right-hand side, which are the best-off areas, and the most deprived areas on the left. But just notice that within these very deprived areas down here, all in the lowest decile for the country, there are, there are some patches with very high alcohol admissions, and others who are deprived who don't have that many alcohol emissions. So there are peculiarities in these areas that we need to understand, which is uh, to try and under, uh, explain why are they heavy users of hospital services. If we map the alcohol versus the control area, the control area up to the northeast of South Sefton, we come down to a hot spot down in the old docks area, the Seaforth area. In that area, their total admissions, twice the average. Their alcohol admissions, nearly ninefold up. Very big problem indeed. Alcohol, oh, sorry, uh, alcohol rated deaths, much, much higher. Uh, liver disease, not quite so high. A lot of these are pre 
liver disease, alcohol crime, you can get the crime data. And for all of these little patches, we can relate benefits, we can relate uh, crime, we can relate uh, child health, uh, 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 particularly um, uh, children in difficulty problems, and we can get lots of stats from uh, uh, many different sources across the council, across the census, etc. So we can do a lot about understanding, but we don't actually know who the individuals are at this stage. If we just compare alcohol and rates across the two, you don't, I hope that shows up across in slightly bright light in front, but you can see that the alcohol problems, particularly down here, and again mapped with the crime problems. Um, my son-in-law used to work in CID in central Manchester and said that the biggest call out by a long, long way was alcohol fueled uh, violence, particularly domestic violence problems. He now works in North Yorkshire and said his biggest problem is sheep rustling. <laughs> <laughs> Quite different. Inner cities do have a problem. Um, and the um, outlets map. Here are our off licenses. Look at our control area. Um, they've got 25 of the lower social areas, 24 off licenses. And they're things like uh, big stores, etc. Down in the bottom area, in a, in a patch of five, we've got 38 off licenses. And these are the bargain boozes of the world. Now, we can't say that it's cause and effect. It's quite just as likely that these are outlets following the purchasers rather than the cause of their problem. But it does suggest opportunities for intervention. One of the problems in these areas is that, as we've said, there's a small number of people. When you actually work it out, of the 6,000 people in, a, in our hotspot, we've defined as five of these areas, 6,000 adults and about 40 to 50 are using the hospital. So this is a small number of people within the area. And it's important to remember that many of these people in these areas are living what we might call normal lives, working, uh, 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 driving cars, doing all the things that other people would be doing. We, we now have, however, a subgroup that we would like to identify. One of the things that we can do at hospital is we can use the coding to flag up when someone comes in based on their previous record. If we flag up, this is a patient who's had previous alcohol admissions and they turn up on, shall we say, the facio maxillary ward with a fracture, someone could summons the nurse. The computer can put a lever in to summons the alcohol nurse team to come and find that patient. So we have ways of finding them. The alcohol nurse team will get referrals elsewhere for the first admissions, but we now have a team in hospital who could find these individuals. One of the suggestions we've made that no one's used yet, but could be done, is we could get consent from these patients. Would you like help, sir? Yes. Could we share your data with your GP, with the social services, with the other agencies, and get you help? There are all sorts of opportunities once we can share data. But at the moment, the data that the council hold is sacrosanct to the council. The data the hospital hold is sacrosanct to the hospital and to send the GP. The GPs have a whole load of data to themselves, um, but we are not good about sharing it, even though it might be in the interest of the individual. The only way we're going to get around the data protection laws is with consent. But there is an opportunity to get consent here and to start initiatives around the individuals. We know these are patients in trouble. They've turned up at hospital and been admitted. So we have a a defined group in trouble, if we focus on them, we have to save money for the service in helping them because we'll keep them out of hospital. Ian quoted uh, uh, examples of teams that have been working well. We know it's possible. And the biggest barrier, as I talk to people in the clerk, is the fiefdoms I run up against. The, there are GP groups who would like to control it all. There are hospital groups who would like to control it all. There are council groups who would like it to come. We'll, they all say, we'll share as long as we lead the team. We have to break that down. Part of it comes down then to managers being willing to permit their staff to share. And that's not always easy. 
I think we can begin to understand the hot areas. We've got a focal, a, a, a small area, 6,000 people, 2,500 homes. We could focus on that. And if we could get the council, the GPs, the hospitals, all the services to focus on that area and get it right, then we could roll out to other areas. And we're suggesting that we can find um, a, a cohort that we could deal with. We could flag the patient. We could do it with consent. And we might just begin to approach not just the individuals, but what is often a chaotic household associated with the individual. And whether we're dealing with COPD, which is my particular area of interest, or alcohol, we are pretty certain that if we find a case, we will find another case within the household. A spouse, a son, uh, 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 another member of the family who's got an associated alcohol problem, often learnt from the index case. And of course, the other thing is that we've got some data now. We can measure the outcome. For this local, local area, we could now produce data quarterly, so annually, as we want, to hopefully show that we are tackling an alcohol-related problem. I think that this in my view, begins to open up the opportunity of not just talking about it, but doing something.